Hello everyone and welcome to Q&A Friday part 5. My channel has just grown to 88 subscribers, so thank you all so much. And it reminds me of the song Rocket 88, the first rock and roll song ever made. So great number, love it. But uh, even though, even though, please like, please subscribe. The more subscribers, the better for me, because it feeds my little ego. And I am a diva after all opera singers, am I right? So first question, Kristin Andersson. Hi, mom. Hope Helsinki is beautiful today. Stockholm most certainly is. It's wonderful. So what do you think about Sibelius? Well, I don't listen to Sibelius as much uh, as many other composers because he didn't really make any operas and the one, I think he almost finished one halfway. But yes, great composer. I love his Kalevala things, especially especially Kullervo is close to my heart. It's so raw and brutal. Um, it really fits with the mood of the tragic tale of Kullervo. So love it. And of course, I uh, unto the audience, annually I go with my mom to Sibelius' house and give our salutations to Sibelius' grave. And those are great trips. We have coffee and we enjoy the nature. Beautiful, beautiful place. But yes, love Sibelius, great music. He should have made more operas though. Then, Nightmare Opera, welcome back. It's good to have you here. Damn that nickname, I should have coined it first. Well, can't have it all. How do you feel about the term classical as a genre? To me, classical always seemed like it should be defined as a period instead. It feels wrong to call contemporary operas or symphonies classical. Should we have a better term for the genre? This has always bugged me. Well, as a kind of a, you know, uh, as, a, as a rooftop rooftop term, classical, I think it's absolutely fine. I mean, still even... I mean, orchestras are still classical orchestras. I mean, there aren't too many changes in instrumentations. There are, except, there are exceptions, but I mean, you don't see saxophones taking over or um, you just have exceptions like, uh, well, Wagner with his tuned anvils or uh, Edgar Varese using a siren as an instrument or, well, even, <laughs> uh, or then uh, uh, Leif Seger somehow he in... Uh, how in Rimsky Korsakov's Sheher uh, Sad, how he had the orchestra scream yeah! for the uh, for uh, for the riding scene. So I mean, there are exceptions, but still, I think the classical is a good term as uh, because the orchestra still remains a classical orchestra with pretty much the same uh, same wind, brass, uh, string instruments. So I think it still works. I think it I think it has its place. Um, but yes, so separations like in metal genres, uh, metal, uh, metal on top, but then you got your sludge and you got your power and you got your thrash and so forth. It's, it's all good, but there's still that rooftop term. I think it works. Don't wo don't worry about it. Don't let it bug you too much. It's it's good to have there because of yeah the orchestra, the, the orchestra man. I I I think it has its place. Rico Matti Kinnonen, hi. Man, I missed you. I mean, I love your posts on Twitter. <laughs> They're awesome. I love love your drink and food moments there and wherever you travel. And man, a man of culture, a man of culture. Wish we could share a gimlet or two soon. What is the process to prepare a new role from scratch? Mm, wow, I could make a whole series of videos on this, but as a short, in a short, to prepare. Well, first what I first what I do. Uh, is uh, watch the watch the opera, read the synopsis, and uh, going through the role. Then I start, of course, to learn the music, translate translate the text, and uh, then when I learn all that, just keep keep working on it and do role analysis all the time. It never ends, even from the premiere to the final performance. The role analysis ever never ends because I because to keep the mood up keep the mood up to find the different moods and modes of your character it it should never end you should always be fascinated about your character but that's uh the process in short but i would like to make a whole video on it that's an excellent question by the way uh Ivarest, do you like echo and the bunny man 
I love them. I know you don't. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Well, Echo and the Bunnymen, you're right. I'm not the biggest fan of Echo and the Bunnymen. But, I mean, for being a being a pop band, I mean, they do have songs that have that really nice kind of creepy, eerie feel to them that I find a bit tantalizing, so I don't hate them. I don't listen to them much, but they have something unique about them. So, <laughs> uh, Ivar, I missed you. It's been such a long time. I hope I get to see you in uh, this summer in Helsinki. Seth Sundman, how was it singing Attila with me? It was wonderful. I mean, there's nothing like singing with a friend. What can I say? It's the best. It's the most wonderful thing. Um, and your voice, man, you've developed. I mean, wow, what a baritone you become. I mean, you were really good before, but who mama. <laughs> wonderful. You were an excellent Ezio. What are the important things to think about when singing and preparing ensemble pieces? Well, one, know your part well. Two, be good at communicating with the others. That's a very important thing to prepare. Like, well, if you're going to do a scene with a friend or a duet with a friend, friend, be prepared so that you know what your character's kind of, you know your character's thought processes a bit and how you how you like to work on them so that there will be no schism, that you have an open communication. Keep it up. That's that's what I can say. Uh, would you... Uh, then? Um, how would you prepare the character of a role that's based on history, such as Attila? Would you derive only from the libretto or also from other artistic tellings and or historical sources? Wow, here's another question that deserves a video of its own, but definitely uh, if it's a historical character, I mean, read through the history. It's very interesting. Watch documentaries. I mean, that's what I do. It works. It works. It really works for a character. If you know about the history and the time period where you're in, it gives you a lot of tools to work with. So, yes, yes, I most certainly would derive from other sources, especially historical sources. Robin Hahn. Hello, it's nice to have a friend in Canada. Uh, Moikka, what is your favorite Finnish word to try to get non-Finnish speakers to try and say? I really don't have words that I want people to try and say, but I'm more in. I I, I more like to uh, tell about words that other countries just don't use. One of my favorites is morkis, which is short for moral hangover which is the uh, phenomena you wake up in a terrible hangover and you go to the bathroom and you see yourself in the mirror and you know that there stands the worst person in the world. And you contemplate this on the tree of woe. Well, your couch, because you can't move much on that day and you eat your pizza and pity yourself all day because you are the worst person in the world. And that is Morkis. One word, short for moral hangover. That's my favorite. I got some other favorites too, but not delving into them right here. But I'd love to. Sue! Zap Varespa. Good to have you back. Hello, Zap Varespa. Great nickname also. Love the Zappa shirt. Ha <laughs> ha! Yes, I was wearing a Frank Zappa shirt with the titties and beer slogan. It's a very nice hoodie, really comfy too. I have a difficult question. What exactly is stage presence? How do you define stage presence? It seems that some people have it and some do not. I wish I had it. Whew. Yes, that is a difficult question. Well, to me, stage presence, well, being present all the time. It's, uh, it's engaging with your audience, engaging with the orchestra, engaging with the ones you are working on stage all the time not only when you sing when you have your lines no all the time if you are in the background and all you do is drink whiskey you drink whiskey and you enjoy the scenery around you you might be at a beautiful market or you might be smoking a pipe 
pipe and drinking coffee and seeing the beautiful archipelago around you and it's a beautiful day and your son is about to get married and you just soak up the atmosphere and the feeling, you know. Stage presence, it's really not that difficult when you engage with the audience, engage, engage with the orchestra, engage with the ones you are on stage and always be active, even though you're doing nothing, just be there, be there in the moment, whatever the moment is. And the hardest part, if you are doing a character that is downbeat and depressed, you cannot be downbeat and depressed by just looking at the floor. It has to, it has to reflect from your face that emotion. So your emotions have to vibrate from your body. You have to be in it. You cannot just put your hands in your pockets. Actually, one of my favorite tales about favorite ta stories I have about um, bad stage presence. I went to watch uh, George Thorogood and the Destroyers. Excellent band, excellent performers, but their saxophone player, when he had nothing to play, he put his saxophone behind his back and his hand is in his pockets. And well, it was incredibly funny, so you could say that that was also partly stage presence because he did with such gusto. So that was a bad story about bad straight stage presence. That was actually stage presence, but with a twist. So be present, be active. Don't ever look dead. That's what I can say. So, hey, thank you for all these wonderful questions. And some of them deserve videos of their own, definitely. Uh, I mean, next week, I'm definitely going to do a video on how to prepare for a historical character. I mean, that's an interesting topic to delve into. And most certainly, I shall. Uh, and once again, please like, please subscribe, share with your friends and until next time, have a wonderful weekend. I'm gonna go buy some beer and ice cream and then watch a movie. Mm, it's gonna be great. Have a good one. Fairly well. <laughs>